Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Come on and let it rise. Let praise arise. Come on from our hearts. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Oh, let it When we praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. Oh, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise. We'll see. There it is. Hey, no, I'm not preaching, so don't, yeah, don't get too excited. But last year around this time, I know Andy's disappointed, really disappointed. Last year at this time, we gave you guys this huge goal. And if you guys saw the boxes in the back there, you saw we are almost to that goal. We gave you a goal of planting 100 churches through the Timothy Initiative. And at $300 a pop, that's $30,000 extra and above what we normally give to the church. And that we thought was a huge goal, but apparently it wasn't big enough because, like I said, we are right at that, uh, that precipice. We're at 99 churches, and I have a feeling, because I've already gotten a couple checks this morning, we're going to pass through that uh, this morning, but that is awesome. So could you guys give yourself a round of applause, because that is really cool. And I want to share one quick story, because I thought it was just, this happened this morning. Miss Patty came in, and she was sharing how her kid, uh, her grandkids got some, some money for Christmas, and she's like, well, we could stop by the store, get you some toys or something like that. And like, no, 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 we want to give it to the church, and we want to give it to, to, to help plant churches around the world. And I thought that was just really cool. It just encapsulates the generous spirit that our church has, and that these kids have grown up, and they're saying, like, no, no, we want to give that money back to the church and help plant churches. Um, so... The total we have raised so far as of last Sunday was $29,750.28, and that is just so cool. And um, we're going to hear stories, like Mark was saying, about compassion and just the, the gospel being spread around the, around the world. And I've known David now uh, for about four or five years, something like that. And the cool thing that I love about David, Karen and I both say this, is that 
he makes you feel special. Like when we first started, uh, like, you know, meeting with the Timothy Initiative, we thought there was a small little organization that, like, you know, oh, okay, you know, maybe they're just start getting started. We didn't realize that they are this huge, huge organization because David will text us every week, every month, something like that, and just say, hi, how you doing? And it just, he made us feel special, and that just is kind of what the Timothy Initiative uh, is all about. It's, it's making people feel special because they are loved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it just, it's really cool. And so it is my privilege to uh, welcome David Nelms. He's going to come and share stories about how God is just using the Timothy Initiative and the Timothys, the disciple makers, um, all around the world. So, David, will you share with us how the, uh, the, the Timothy Initiative is doing? Well, it is a pleasure to be back with you guys. I was sitting over there uh, thinking to myself, you know, I'm in a lot of churches. And by the way, this is, I think, uh, Joe, where's Joe? Is he outside smoking again? Where's Oh, there he is back there. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't know if this is my fourth straight year here or fifth. Fifth? Okay. But let me tell you something. That's a world's record for me. I, I rarely get invited back a second time, okay? So to be here five straight years, that's like, whoa, I can't believe it. But I'm sitting over there by my uh, beautiful 29-year-old wife. Okay, Loretta. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is what church ought to be. Uh, where's uh, the guy I prayed with this morning? The little girl's name, Gabriella? Eliana. So sweet. Uh, just so sweet. A little eight-year-old girl, she wanted to pray. And just the fellowship and the worship. And, you know, church is supposed to be a family. Did you all know that? We call ourselves brothers and sisters. And we all have the same father. And Jesus is our elder brother. We're a family. And that's what church is supposed to be. And I feel like the gathering is that. I feel like this is real church. And so I just, I'm just honored to be here. I'm honored to be on your team. And 99 churches. Good night. 99 churches. That's just, it's just incredible. I spent 37 years as a pastor. It took me 37 years to start two churches, okay? And you guys have started 99, or will they will be started by the time it's over with so far this year. And I'm like Josh. I'm pre if you guys don't raise that last 250, I'm going to throw it in myself, okay? So uh, 100 churches this year, that's incredible. Let me tell you where those churches are going to go. They go primarily, not 100%, but overwhelmingly, they go to, to plant churches in places where there are no churches. We work, most of our work, 86, 87 percent of our work is among what's called unreached people groups or UPGs. And by the way, when I say we, we includes the gathering. TTI can't do anything without you guys. We're just a, we're just a slide on a screen without you guys. So when I say we, I'm talking about you guys. We together work in among unreached people groups. Right now we're working among 970 different unreached ethnicities around the world. There's only 7,000 that are classified as unreached, and we'll be over 1,000 of them this coming year. So we're, it's kind of getting up there. But to, under, to explain what an unreached people group would be, let's let this auditorium here rec, uh, represent a people group in ethnicity. You're the gathering, not, uh, gathering nights, okay? You're a, a group of people called the gathering. And let's let every one of these seats, chairs that you guys are sitting in, represent a village. So maybe there's 500 people in this village and 1,000 in this one and 300 in this one and 5,000 in this one and 2,000 in this one and 200 in this one. So each one of these chairs represent a village that make up this ethnicity. If you guys were an unreached ethnicity, an unreached people group, there would be churches in these front one, two, three, four, five villages right over here. There would be a church in each of these five villages, and the rest of them, there would be no church. Never been a church. May never be one if somebody doesn't get on the ball. Now, you say, well, can't these people drive over here? Well, these people don't have a car. Never been, not only have they never, never had a church, they've never had a car. 
and they're born back here, you guys in this part of the of the ethnicity, you're born over here, you live over here, you die, and you've ne- you'll never see these people will never see you guys. Some of these will never see you guys. And so you're born, you live, you die, you go into eternity lost without Jesus Christ. And may I remind you that the Bible is very clear. There is Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. And almost every week in my life, somebody will walk up to me and say, are you telling me that, that uh, even those who never heard of Jesus won't go to heaven when they die? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. Peter said, neither is there salvation in any other name under heaven that's been given among mankind except the name Jesus Christ. You say, well, that's horrible. They, uh, it's not fair that they haven't heard the gospel. I know. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, God sent his son. Isn't what that what's, what's Christmas is all about? God sent his son to be the savior of the world. What more can he do? The last thing Jesus told us to do was to go make disciples to the ends of the earth. That's the very last thing he told us to do. It's been 2,000 years. We haven't, we haven't done it yet. There are still 3 billion people on the face of the earth who are parts of unreached people groups. They're born, they live, they die. They go into eternity lost, not because they're rejecting Jesus. They don't know who he is, and they don't know who he is because nobody's ever told them. So that's what excites me to be able to be in a church here, the gathering, Fuquay, and to look at that board back there, 99 out of 100 churches. I just commend you guys. You're, uh, I thank you. I thank you for your vision. Pastor Joe, Josh, I thank you guys, the whole team here. I thank you for having a vision for not only here and near, but also, also far. And by the way, all of your churches, just as a reminder, I've been here so many times, you probably know, you probably say it for me, but, but each of your churches are also challenged to take care of an orphan or a widow or a traffic slave. So that 99 churches also represents 99 orphans, widows, traffic slaves. So you're making an impact in a lot of lives. Now, there's two things that we have to have as your partner to do what's happening. One is the funding. You're taking care of that. But the other is just as important, the prayer. I I cannot stress the prayer enough. You received a card, I think, as you came in this morning, I think one per family. If you didn't get one, would you raise your hand? If you didn't get one, everybody have one? Don't be afraid to raise your hand. All right, we need one or two down front here, Joe. If we could just put your hand up again. Pastor Joe will get you one. Need one right over here. Let me tell you why this card is really important. Right here, Pastor. Uh why this card is real important two weeks ago in just one country that we work in we work in 30 something countries in just one country two weeks ago we had four different people arrested and put in jail for talking to others about jesus forget planting a church all they did was just try to tell someone about jesus four different people one of them was a widow okay and one of them, to my knowledge, is still in jail. The other three were released on bail, but they've, they've got a court date. They've got to go back. And by the way, they're guilty. They were talking to people about Jesus. And in this particular country, if you talk to someone about Jesus, it doesn't matter if they accept the Lord. If you just talk to them about Jesus, uh, you can go to prison for three, four, five years. In another country we're in, we're in this week, this week, a state with about 50 million people in a huge state, uh, passed a law where it's illegal to convert from one religion to another. So if if you're a Muslim or a Hindu, and I tell you about Jesus, and you convert to Christianity, you broke the law. And if you do, you have to go to the government and tell them, I have converted to Christianity, and that creates all kinds of problems. All kinds of problems. That's not a law that they're hoping to pass it has passed okay it's on the books so what am i saying i'm saying all the money in the world is not going to change that that's what this card is about i want you here's what you do take your card in your hand you should have one and you tear off the bottom part this little 
uh, dark part here. That'll take you to the web page, and you can find out more of what's going on. And you fill out this card, and now listen very closely. There's a green box here that talks about planting a church once a year on your own funding, and I'm not asking you to fill out that today. You've already, you're doing great on, on the funding that you're already doing. What I am asking you to do is to sign up for prayer. If you fill out this card, we're going to send you prayer requests about once a month or so, and 99% of what we send you is going to be about prayer. And we just ask that you pray when you can and then delete the email. Don't ever, don't ever post it on social media. Just pray and delete, pray and delete. That's all we're asking you to do. And the, the gathering here, the entire church can be involved, not only planting 100 churches, but praying as the work goes on all over the world. If you fill out the card and on your way out, just in your boxes on either side, just drop it in the box and they'll get it to me. And I want to tell you something, and I mean this. If somebody walks up to me after church and says, would you rather have $10,000 or have me join the prayer team? My answer to you would be, can I please have both, okay? That's what I would say, can I please have both? But if you say, no, David, you're being greedy, you got to pick one or the other, I'd say give me the prayer, fill out the prayer card. And if you don't think I'm telling the truth, try me after church. I'll tell you, fill out the card, put it in the box. That's what we need. We need your prayers. I think of, of a verse, there's a verse in Corinthians, and this is not part of my sermon, guys. I'll get there sooner or later. But there's a, there's a verse in Corinthians, chapter 16, verse 9, where Paul said, there is a great door for effective work opened for me, but there are many adversaries. Great open door, that's the positive. Many adversaries. That's the negative. And almost every day in my life, I think of that verse. Joe, this is the first church I would have announced this in, but this year we have passed the 25,000 mark of new churches being started this year. 25,000. Okay? While we're meeting here this morning in church, there'll be at least two more churches started somewhere around the world. As large as that is come January what next week yeah next Sunday's January 2nd starting next week throughout next year we will be training an additional 300,000 Timothys and what we call Tituses those are our church planters and our disciple makers 300,000 I just don't know of anything like that there is a great opportunity especially in East Africa. We were talking about that earlier today. A great opportunity for effective work, but there are many adversaries. We have never had the attacks that we're facing right now. That's what this is about, the prayer. Please fill it out, put it in the box on your way out. Now, without having been said, I want to talk to you today on the subject of can God use you or God can use you. Today, it's my prayer that you leave here convinced that God can, not only that he can, but that he wants to use you. And I think if we were to go around this room and ask, how many of you believe God can use you? I think everybody would say yes. So you may have already kind of tuned me out. You, know, you may already be thinking, well, I already know that. I know God can use me. I know God wants to use me. But I don't believe that most of us believe it down in our hearts. I think we accept as an intellectual truth from the Scriptures that God is willing to use us. I think we accept that as a biblical fact. But I don't think that we really believe it in the depths of our hearts that God really, really, really wants to use me. By me, I mean you and 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 you. And you. But he does. In John 15 and verse 16, it's an incredible verse. Jesus said, uh, if we can put it up there for me, guys, you didn't choose me, I chose you. By the way, I love this. I, I don't know that he said it this way, but I can almost hear the Lord say, hey, hold on a second, let's get something straight. You did not choose me. I chose you. Why did he choose you? He said, I, I appointed you 
that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain or abide. Jesus said, I chose you, I appointed you to bear fruit. Well, what is the fruit of a Christian? The fruit of a Christian is another Christian. Uh, crickets produce crickets. Crows produce crows. Christ followers produce Christ followers. The fruit of a Christian is another Christian. Jesus said, I chose you to produce other believers. If you're not sure that's exactly what it's saying, look at the next verse, Matthew 28, verse 19. Many of you probably know this verse by heart. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go make disciples, all nations. And by the way, when he said, the, who's he talking to? He's talking to his followers. You say he was talking to the pastors. No, 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 no. When this verse was uh, spoken, Matthew 28, there were no pastors. The church hadn't been birthed yet. The day of Pentecost was still weeks away. He was not talking to ordained pastors. There was not an ordained minister on the face of the earth. Are you hearing me? He was not talking to people like me. He was talking to people like you. They were regular, normal people who just loved Jesus Christ. And he looked at those regular, normal people, and he said to them, Go make disciples here, near, and far. You are his You are his. Uh, fruit makers. You are his disciple makers, his fruit bearers, his, his disciple makers. You are his ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20. Look what it says. You know this verse already. Paul wrote right to the church at Corinth. We are ambassadors for Christ. God's making his appeal, appeal through us to, be, to tell the world, world be reconciled, brought back to a right relationship with God. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And let me tell you something. That church at Corinth, they had a few issues. They were not a perfect church, okay? Uh, you probably would not have wanted to be a part of that church. And yet Paul looked at that church. He wrote to them, and he didn't say, I'm an ambassador and you're the embassy workers. That's not what he said. He said, we are ambassadors. Do you know who you are? You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You're more than an embassy worker. You are ambassadors. Do you know what an ambassador does? An ambassador is sent as a personal representative of the king into a foreign country to represent the king there to deliver the message that the king has for those people. Jesus, Paul here says, the word of God says, we are his ambassadors. Our Father, the King of all kings, has sent us as his ambassadors here into this foreign country to represent him and to deliver his message. And what is his message? That, that Fuquay and the Raleigh Durham Mary can be reconciled to God. You see, you're, you're not from this place, or at least this place is not your home. You say, David, wait a minute, I was born right down the road. Uh, this, this is my home. No, you're, you're, this place is not your home. Philippians 3, verse 20 says that our citizenship is in heaven. I, I love the United States, but my citizenship is in heaven. That's my home for all eternity. Loretta and I were driving down the road. We live up on the Briar Creek area, if any of you know where that is, up uh, Highway 70. And we were driving somewhere not too long ago, a couple of months ago. And I told her, I said, you know, I'm having a hard time figuring out where I want to be buried. <clears throat> and she said, why in the world are you thinking about being buried? Uh, I said, well, I am almost 68 years old. I know you thought I was like in my 40s. But uh, I said, I am 68 years old. And plus, men die uh, usually statistically about seven or eight years before women do. And by the way, I don't know why that is. I mean, have you ever thought about that, guys? statistically, you're going to die before she does, okay? I have no idea why. My theory is you women put stuff in our coffee when we're not watching, okay? That's my theory. But whatever the reason is, I said, I'm, going to, I'm probably more than likely going to die first statistically. And uh, I don't know where I want to be buried. I said, I don't want to be buried in North Carolina. No offense. But, I mean... Good night. I might end up being buried next to some Duke fan. Amen? And that would be like, that's like the last place I want to be buried. And then I thought, she said, well, why don't we bury you in Georgia? That's where you're from. A bunch of rednecks down there. I don't want to be buried in Georgia. 
and she's from Indiana. She said, what about Indiana? Hoosiers. What is a Hoosier? Does anybody even know what a Hoosier is? Try to define it. You can't. I don't want to be buried. And, and, and I, I kept thinking, I can't think of any place I want to be buried. And you know what? The thought occurred to me, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I've been sent here for a reason to represent my king, to tell people everywhere I go, they can be reconciled to God. That's what these verses are telling you. You are his fruit bearers. You are his disciple makers. You are his ambassadors. And finally, you are his witnesses. Acts 1 and verse 8, the very last thing that came out of the mouth of red letter Jesus, the very last thing. These, the, listen, He's, I can see his feet hovering above the ground. I mean, he's getting ready to take off. The very next verse, he disappears in the clouds. His very last comment was, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Question, gathering. How many of y'all have the Holy Spirit living inside of you? Say amen. All right, well, all right. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my church attenders. Is that what it said? What does it say? You shall be my, say it together, you shall be my witnesses. Oh, what does a witness do? A witness tells what they've seen, what they've heard, what they know to be the truth about Jesus Christ. And look where you're to witness. In Jerusalem, that's like saying Fuquay. In Judea, that's like saying whatever this county is, I don't even know. And Samaria, Samaria was close by but a different culture. Don't forget about the Samaritans in the area. And ultimately, to the ends of the earth. Now, for you, ends of the earth is Guatemala. For you, ends of the earth is Kenya. For you, ends of the earth is wherever. Okay, it's just way over on the other side somewhere. But the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And here in this very last statement Jesus made, he connected the coming of the Holy Spirit directly, his reason for coming directly to giving us the authority and power we need to be his witnesses. I know the Holy Spirit came for other reasons. But directly, Jesus said to his followers, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. I'm going up. He's coming down. He's going to come inside of you. And him living inside of you is going to give you the power you need to tell people all over your area as my ambassadors what you've seen, what you've heard, what you know to be the truth about who I am. You're going to make disciples for me. You're going to bear fruit for me. You're going to reproduce yourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, this is who we are. We are his fruit bearers, his disciple makers, his ambassadors, his witnesses. Now, this much I know about this church. You guys believe the Bible is the Word of God. Everything I've told you so far this morning, I've backed up with the Word of God. Now, do you believe what you've heard? If you do, say amen. All right, well, then we got a problem. Because the enemy comes along and convinces us that God can't use us this way. Well, I can't tell anybody about Jesus. I can't make a disciple. I can't reproduce. <laughs> me, an ambassador for, for Almighty God? <laughs> Not me. The enemy convinces us that God can't really, I mean, we can pass out a card or we can park a car or we can, uh, I mean, I got here this morning. I saw Pastor Joe out there picking up garbage. God bless you, Joe. I don't see that much anymore. That's what I did to the day I, I stepped down from pastoring. Every Sunday morning, I went outside and I picked up garbage, okay? Uh, I, I just, it, it just touched my heart seeing you do it. And we can all pick up garbage, and we can all pass out cards. We can all make coffee and praise God, and we need to do every bit of that. But most of us think that's all we can do. Everyone in this room can be a witness. Everyone in this room can be a disciple maker. But the enemy tells you that you can't. He'll say to you, you're not smart enough. You've not been trained well enough. You're not gifted enough. You're not good enough. He may be saying to you, if these people had any idea what you were doing last week, they'd, they wouldn't even want you sitting in here, much less uh, you being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. May I remind you something about our enemy, John 8, verse 44? It's a great verse, John 8, 44. Look at the very end of the verse there. Jesus said this about Satan. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. 
for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan will lie to you and say, God can't use you. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You've never been to Bible college. You didn't go to seminary. You, you, can't, you don't know the Greek. You don't know the Hebrew. You, can, you can't be used. You've not been trained well enough. Let me tell you something about Satan. When he opens his mouth, he lies. He'll say to you, yeah, but you got drunk. You've got a jail record. You, you did this and you did that and, and uh, you messed up on drugs and you've been married four times and you've, you've this and you're, th- you're this and you're that. Somebody said when Satan brings up your past, you bring up his future. When he reminds you of your past, just remind him of his future. and He'll shut up real quick. May I remind you that practically everybody in the Bible, there's maybe a couple of exceptions, but practically everybody in the Bible that God used in a great and marvelous way were people that, my goodness, they had issues. Do you remember Noah? Noah's Ark, the big boat. Remember the worldwide flood? The whole, the whole, all the human race was wiped out except Noah's family. God used Noah to save the human race from extinction. Let me tell you something about Noah you may not know. When he finally got off that boat, and I'm, I, I fly every, I just passed 2 million miles with Delta. I keep my mask here, my Timothy Initiative mask, by the way. Okay? And I get so tired of wearing this thing for two or three hours on the plane. But imagine being stuck on a boat with a bunch of animals for like a whole year. Okay? When he finally got off that boat, the first thing Noah did was he made an altar to God to worship God. Good. That's what I would have expected. You know the second thing Noah did? He got drunk. Who would have thought that? He got drunk, and that drunkenness led to a conflict with one of his sons, and and literally the human race just started going... From that point on, it started going down. It's just like the Garden of Eden. It was a Garden of Eden all over. Everything just went south from that moment on. I mean, God, out of all the people on the face of the earth, who does God choose to save the human race? A drunkard. If God can use a guy that gets drunk to save the human race, can God use you? You ever heard of a guy named Jacob? Jacob was a rascal. He was a a manipulating, scheming rascal. His father's sick as he can be, thinks he's going to die. He's gone blind. He's on his sick bed. And Jacob comes in and lies, claiming to be the elder brother in order to steal that brother's birthright. And his father says, "Is that? it sounds like Jacob, but you... Uh, but you say you're, you're Esau, is this really, is this really my, bro- my son Esau? And Jacob lies through his teeth and says, yes, I'm not Jacob. And he takes the birthright, the blessing, the inheritance, and he runs. Who lies to their father when he's sick and blind laying in bed? Who would do that? Uh, Jacob. By the way, did God use Jacob? God changed his name to, do you know what he changed Jacob's name to? Israel, the father of Israel. If God can use a lying, scheming, manipulating man like Jacob, can God use you? You ever heard of a guy named Moses? Split the Red Sea? Call manna down from heaven? Wrote the Ten Commandments, the great lawgiver? Uh, wrote the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Faced down Pharaoh eye to eye and said, let my people go. Those Ten Commandments he wrote, one of them said, thou shalt not kill. Guess what Moses did? Killed a man. Cold-blooded murder. God took a murderer and used him to write the Ten Commandments. If God can use a murderer like Moses, can God use you? You ever heard of a guy named Samson? Big, strong Samson, had the long hair. By the way, when I get to heaven, I'm going to look like Samson, okay? I've asked God to give me hair. Uh, Samson was, uh, Samson was, I don't even know how to, 
Samson had hormone issues, okay? He just, he just never saw a, a lady that he didn't fall in love with, okay? And it didn't matter what kind of lady she was. He just, if, if, if it was a lady, she, he, was, he was there and got himself in trouble, got, got himself blinded. But let me tell you how God used Samson. Samson took out twice as many of the enemies of God at his death as he had in his entire lifetime. And God used this very immoral man, very immoral, to be the great judge of Israel. If God can use a, a whoremongering male to judge his nation, to be the leader of his nation, can God use you? You ever heard of a guy named David? You know David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, man after God's own heart, uh, wrote half the book of Psalms, uh, killed the lion with his bare hands, killed the bear with his bare hands, became the little shepherd boy, David and Goliath. You know the stories? Uh, maybe have you, but Do you also remember David is the king of Israel now, looks out and sees a woman taking a bath, and he lusts after her, and he brings her into his palace, and he has a relationship with her. She's a married woman. He sleeps with another man's wife, but what you may not know is the man who was married to Bathsheba was like an equivalent of kind of a, a flash Navy SEAL. He was one, one of a group of elite soldiers out of a million soldiers. There were about 50 that were referred to as David's mighty men. I mean, they were like the Navy SEALs. These guys were the elite of the elite, and they were pledged to give their lives to David. In fact, while David is sleeping with Bathsheba, her husband is out on the battlefield fighting David's battles. And when David realized he'd got her pregnant, he brought Uriah back and had Uriah put to death to try to cover up his sin. Who does that? I doubt if there's anybody in this room that slept with your good friend's wife and then killed your good friend to cover it up. I doubt if there's anyone like that in this room. But David did that. You say, did, David still, did God still use David after that? Oh, you better believe it. You go all the way to the very first page of the New Testament, the first page, the first chapter, the first verse, and your New Testament starts out like this. Jesus Christ, the Son of David. If God can use an adulterous murderer like David, can God use you? Are you beginning to pick up on a theme here? How many of you see it? Say amen. Ever heard of uh, Jonah? The best way I can describe Jonah, Jonah had issues. God said, go that way. Jonah said, forget you. And Jonah went this way. And you know the story, the whale or the big fish, and they throw him in, and he sat in that whale's belly for three days, and he spit them out. And he went running to Nineveh, and he finally said, okay, I'm not going through that again. I learned my lesson. So he preached to Nineveh. It was basically a turn or burn type message. And the whole city repents. And those people are like the worst of the worst there's 120,000. Everybody repented. Everybody. It says from the king all the way to the stable hand. Everybody repented. The whole city, every single person repented at Jonah's message. It says even the animals walked around in sackcloth and ashes. That was a way of you dressed in that day to show that you're, you had repented of your sins and you were sorrowful over your sins. You say, how do animals repent? I have no idea. You say, it'd be like if you got home today and your dog meets you at the front door and he's dressed in sackcloth and ashes and he's crying. You say, I don't understand that, David. I don't either, but ask Joe. He's your pastor, amen? I don't, I don't have any idea. All I know is that's what the Bible says. The whole city repented. It was probably the greatest revival there's ever been in the history of mankind. I've never seen anything like that. 120,000 people, it says. They all repented. And God spared Nineveh for over another hundred years because of their repentance. You see, I bet Jonah was really excited, right? You know what Jonah's doing? He's sitting outside the city on a hill waiting to see the fire fall from heaven and can't wait to see it burn or see them burn. And when Jonah finally realizes God's not going to 
judge them because of their repentance. Jonah gets so upset with God, he says, then kill me. I'd rather die than see those people live. What kind of an attitude is that? The man's a prophet of God. He needs to get a new job, amen? I mean, that'd be like if uh, I, I was checking out your, your, your population around here. That would be like the entire population of Fuquay, Holly Springs, Apex, rolled into one plus more. If every single person in Fuquay, Holly Springs, Apex, and a few thousand more, if every one of them, if Pastor Joe stood up today and preached, and every single one of the people in those three cities got saved, and then Joe says, God, I'd rather you burn them alive. Just go ahead and kill me. What? What? You would you would think you would have thought Jonah would have been the, the happiest guy on the face of the earth. His heart was as hard as marble, and yet God used him. If God can use a hard-hearted prophet, can He use you? You ever heard of James and John, the sons of thunder? Two of the early apostles. Sons of thunder was not a compliment. These guys are walking down the road one day and they see somebody and they start talking to them and they say, get in line behind us and, as we follow. and the guy said, no, I don't want to follow you. And James and John got so upset, they went to Jesus and said, Lord, can we call fire down from heaven and consume them right now? I mean, what kind of an attitude is that? Jesus said, you're like sons of thunder. You're loud and mean and angry and, and boisterous and and yet, you say, can God use us? Maybe you've got road rage or you've got a bad temper. You say, can God use me? You know what he did with James and John? James became one of the very first martyrs in the church, and John became the apostle of love. John is the one who was at the foot of the cross with Jesus, and as Jesus hung on the cross, he looked down at John, and Mary was there next to John, and, and, G, and Jesus said, Mom, you go home with John. John. My mom is your mom now. Mary, you take care of Mary. John is one who was leaning over on our Lord's side at that last supper. You've seen the picture. John is the one who wrote the Gospel of John, who wrote the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3:16, for God so loved the world. John wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. He wrote the book of Revelation, the very last book in the Bible. Can God use a son of thunder? Oh, my goodness. If God can use a man like John, can God use you? I could go on and on forever. Paul put Christians in prison. I don't care how low you are. I doubt if anyone in this room has ever, has ever drug a Christian out of their house, thrown them on the ground, gathered a bunch of people together and said, kill them. That's what Paul did. Yet God used him to write one half of the books of the New Testament. You see, God wants to use you. We have an enemy that comes to us and says, God can't use you because of this, 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 or that. But our Lord said about that enemy, he is a liar and the father of all lies. Well, my time is up, but can I just show you a couple of pictures real quick? I won't tell you the stories. The first guy here, he uh, has no legs. You want to put that first picture up for me? There we go. No legs. Uh, stands out on the street corner the best you can with no legs. Witnesses to people all day. Most people won't even look at him. I've been in his churches in West Africa. Place about half the size, packed with people. Just He's led over 100 people to the Lord. He doesn't have any legs. Most people in this room have legs. If a guy with no legs can lead 100 people to Christ, what can we do? If God use you, if you can use him. Look at the next picture. This is a gal that uh, can't read and write. She's illiterate, very, very poor, very poor lady. Cannot read, cannot write. Within the first four months, she led over 80 people to Jesus Christ. 80 people. How many of you people can read and write? Oh, don't raise your hand, but most of you can read and write, can't you? Unless you're from maybe Raleigh, you can read and write, okay? <laughs> so everybody in this room can read and write. She's led over 80 people to the Lord in four months. Four months. If God can use her, can God use you? Oh, yeah. Look at the next picture. This is uh, 
uh, oh, a bunch of blind widows in East Africa. They're blind. They got saved. Little Timothy started a church there. And now those blind widows, they hold hands and they walk from village to village the best they can. Out in the bush, there's no sidewalks or roads. They just walk village to village. And they've led a bunch of other widows to the Lord. And, and several churches have been started. A bunch of not just widows, blind widows out in the bush in Africa. God used them to start churches. If God can use a bunch of blind widows, can God use you? Look at the next picture. This is uh, uh, the guy robbed a house, stole everything in it, including a Bible. Never seen a Bible, read it, got saved, came back to the house, gave all the stuff back, said, I'm the thief, that his name's not really Dan. Somebody in our office named him Dan. That's not his name. But they, they Dan, the Bible thief, brought it all back and said, I'm, I'm sorry. This book told me about Jesus. I've, I've become his follower. He'd never seen a Bible. They brought him into the home, made him one of their sons. The guy ended up becoming a Timothy and started a church in the very house he had robbed. If God can use a thief, can God use you? Look at the next picture. This guy, I love this guy. This is uh, Kara and Josh. This is North Kenya up along the South Sudan and Ethiopian border, that area. Dasanach people. Uh, the guy, we, we showed a Jesus film there, and, and uh, he'd never seen a movie. He started throwing rocks at the movie, or the screen when the Roman soldiers were crucifying Jesus. He thought it was really happening. He was, he was going to hit those, he was going to drive those Roman soldiers off. And then he walked behind the screen and realized it was just an image. And he got saved that night. He became a Timothy. The guy can't read. He can't write. It's been about five years since that happened. About the time I met you guys is when this happened. It's been about five years. They have now started, through this guy's ministry, over 100 new churches. First generation, second generation, third generation. A guy who has never seen a movie and can't read and write. I refuse to believe that God can't use you. I won't believe it. I refuse to accept that. Look at the next slide. This is a, a, a college girl. She goes to school all day, takes public transportation several hours outside the city. They let her off at the base of a mountain. She starts climbing the mountain. She comes across a village, leads the entire village to Christ, and they start a church. She trains some people there. They say there's another village on up another couple of miles down the, up the trail. So she walks on up finds another village, leads the entire village to Christ. Everybody, I've been there, I've seen it with my own eyes. Everybody came to Christ. They've started several churches there. And then she makes her way back down the mountain about midnight by that time, and she waits on the bus, and the bus picks her up and takes her several hours back to the city, and she goes back to school the next day. And she's been doing that for about three years now, three, four years, and she has no help and no money, and she doesn't, she doesn't have, she just loves Jesus, and she's letting God use her. If God can use Ganga, can God use you? Oh, my goodness. Look at the next picture. Ah, oh, look at the next picture. Let me skip her and... Uh, skip that one, and here's what I want to end with. Most pastors start with their verses. Let me end with mine. Now to him, oh, praise his holy name. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. That's the reference to the Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus said the Holy Spirit's going to come and he will give you power? Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church, that's you, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Can God? Oh, God can. Now, who wants to be used of God? Who wants to be a disciple maker? Who wants to be a fruit bearer? Who wants to be an ambassador? Who wants yeah. For those of you who say, I'm in, what are your responses? I close with this. Last slide up there, guys. Begin praying. Join the prayer team. But don't just pray for TTI. Pray for your church. Pray for your leaders. Pray for your country. Pray for our, our, our civil leaders. Pray for Pastor Joe. Pray for the staff here. Pray for the team here. Pray for us.
Don't just pray for TDI. Pray for your children. Pray for your family. Write down the names of everybody you know that doesn't know the Lord and start praying for them. You say, oh, God won't say. That's what the enemy wants you to believe. Don't listen to the He lies. Start praying. This little card is a good way to kind of jumpstart it, but, but don't just pray for us. Pray for your families. Keep investing. Man, you've given 100 churches. Keep going. If you guys can do that 10 more years, that's 1,000 churches. 1,000 churches out of this place. Think about that. It's incredible. Keep investing. Has it occurred to you that maybe God's given you what he's given you for a reason? Not just to tear down your barns and build a bigger barn. Maybe he's blessed you to be a blessing. Let it flow through you. Don't just stick it in your pockets. Let it flow through you. And finally, make disciples here. You see, before Jesus said ends of the earth, he said Jerusalem. Starts right here. It's real easy to listen to a message like this. Is, oh, I'm going to go to the ends of the earth. No, 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 no. This is where you are. You do it here. If you don't do it here, getting on a plane flying over there is not going to make you do it there. Okay? Make disciples here. And by the way, start with your children. If you don't disciple your children, nobody else is going to. God gave them to you for a reason. Start there. I'm so honored to be on your team. God bless you. Thank you so much. Josh. Wow. Thank you, David. That was awesome. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, God can use us, and God has used us. Um, I have some awesome news. Uh, I was so excited to get these uh, this morning. I wanted to, I can't wait to share with you guys. But we have raised an additional $6,500 this morning. So that's another 21 churches. And I want to say this before we use, we stop. That doesn't mean we have to stop. I mean, three. I can't think of a better way to spend $300. Can you guys? I mean, $300 is not just starting a church, but that is a church that is supporting an orphan and widows and, and traffic uh, people. And those are people that are then planting more churches. It's not just, it's the first generation of a church that makes disciples, that makes disciples, that makes disciples. So that is an exciting way to spend $300. So I think Mark and the band are going to come and, uh, and play us out, but we're not doing communion this morning, but I'm going to be in the back. If you have decided or something David uh, said spoke to you and you want to uh, give to plant another church, I'll be in the back and make Maybe you can come back there, and uh, if you're an older person have checks still, you can do that. But if you're a younger person, and you're like, what are checks? And you have no idea, you can also go online at ttionline.org, and you can give there. And we would love to see 150, 200, however many churches planted. So as the band plays us out, if you're moved to do that, like I said, I'll be in the back. You can come give that check. Write that check out, though, to the Timothy Initiative, because we'll just give it to David directly as he goes out this morning. Thank you, guys.